In the village of Xiaogang in Anhui, student groups from local technical colleges are on an educational visit to one of the places where China's reform movement began 40 years ago. But back then, most universities and colleges had been closed down by the upheavals of the Cultural Revolution. So, so what has brought you here to Xiaogang? Why have you come? And the difference in the 40 years is just huge, isn't it? In 1970, there were only 48,000 people in higher education in China. Deng Xiaoping will be very proud of you. Today, the figure is 36 million. It's an astonishing turnaround. So how did China do it? So safe, thank you. In traditional China, education was the priority for state, family and individual. Not only the path to preferment, it was the key to an ordered and moral society. The best people were chosen by sitting state-sponsored examinations. To come first in the national exams was a matter of civic pride. And here in Suzhou, there's a temple to the god of education with a very special honors board. This gives you an idea of how seriously the Chinese took the examination system. This is a list of the 51 scholars just from the town of Suzhou here who got top marks in the imperial examinations between the 9th century and the 1870s. And the local guidebook says that Suzhou has had a galaxy of culture and scholars, so this temple was well worshipped in olden days. That reverence for exams survived the end of the empire in 1911. The old system of learning was passed on to new universities set up on the Western model and then on to the People's Republic. But in the 1960s, in the chaos of the Cultural Revolution, most universities were closed down. When I finished my high school, uh, I went to a factory in Shanghai. I did not have any hope to enter university. A whole generation of young people was sent to the countryside for what was called re-education. I would say the probably last cohort of people from high school that you know, have to go to the countryside to receive re-education. I was thinking of my life was just, you know, I'm to stay there for, for my lifetime. Just gonna be in that village. By the time the Cultural Revolution ended in 1976, the education system had collapsed. For China's new leader, Deng Xiaoping, this above all needed urgent action if education was to be the motor of reform. In summer 1977, Deng held an education conference. He was anxious for the exams to restart as soon as possible. When the news announced that actually we can take the examination to get into college, we were just so, we were just so happy and we exhilarated. It's just, uh, you know, such a uh, you know, life-changing you know, sort of moment for us. The conference delegates told Deng that the exams should be free, fair and open to all. He agreed. The date was scheduled before the end of the year and the response was overwhelming. 
was very tough. 5.7 million candidates applying for the exam. Only less than 5% were admitted. And ages varied from you know, 18 to 35 you know, in my class. I was 20 at that time. They were coal miners, <laughs> they were farmers, they were soldiers, they were <laughs> workers, young apprentices like me. So that exam changed the life of many people. For a culture that for so long had believed in the value of education, it was a watershed moment. When Deng Xiaoping made a new push for science and technological development as an engine for China's growth. He let the students go overseas again. He let the American universities back in. In the 20 years after 1978, well over 200,000 Chinese students went to the US. I remember, I think it's Brzezinski, National Security Advisor to, to Jimmy Carter, Austin, you know, how many students you want to send to the United States? Uh, then said, how many you can uh, receive? Yeah, for us, no limit. So it's uh, a lot of courage because that uh, living standard between China and the West was so different. You know, China was much lower, and the many were concerned that students may not choose to return to China. And then said at internal party meetings that if one out of ten can return to China this policy will be a victory for us. In the UK, one of the University of Kent's alumni would become China's ambassador in London. China was so eager to send more people abroad, we were asked two of us would share one scholarship. I kept my, my food cost at one pound a day. <laughs> <laughs> so I could uh, buy book and uh, have the luxury of a half a pint of a beer in the student's bar once a month. I could feel the strong wind of change. Uh, the Chinese, many people like me, started to face the world and uh, rediscover the world and also to learn from the world. And so, as Deng had hoped, the student generation who went abroad are now coming home to work for the next phase of the reform and opening up. We've sent, as of late last year, over 5 million Chinese students across the border to the West to pursue degree programs. And by this time, more than 3 million have returned to China. I spent uh, 16 years in the United States to get my degree and to work uh, at a university for several years. The reason that I came back to Shenzhen is the, I like the resources and opportunity it provides to all kinds of people who have a dream to achieve something. 40 years on, China is now the most popular university destination in all of Asia. China has been able to place a number of its universities in the top 100 in a short amount of time. But the question is, will this stay there? The answer to that question for Chinese educationalists is for their universities to break away from traditional learning and to develop new kinds of curricula. In China, we have about 3,000 universities and colleges. If you look at these universities from a distance, they are more or less the same, meaning they are crafted, their curriculum training is crafted along, you know, uh, you know from a single mode, if you will. So that, I, we think, many of us in China and in the world believe, is one of the key reasons why innovation uh, hasn't been uh, commensurate with the wisdom of the Chinese. The problem is that in today's China, university exams are still based on traditional forms of learning. Students in China have to pass the college entrance examination, so they have to like prepare for ten, more than 10 years maybe. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, they have to work hard to get the famous university. 
How many hours a day when you were at school did you work? Uh, maybe like more than 12 hours. Yeah. More than 12? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to change that mindset will involve an almost civilizational shift from the way China has always thought about education. The imperial examination system is that you have to remember the great classicals and then to recite them and interpret them and so on. But the other uh, group of thought was saying, we actually, we need to provide them not just a fish, but rather to teach them how to fish, how to broaden their intellectual horizon, provide them with the, in, you know, how to think cre critically, creatively. And so this two school of thoughts, you know, always having to fight and how the tension between those two schools of thought is resolved will be crucial to the next phase of China's opening up. Recently, people are saying the university education should really uh, uh, broaden the, uh, you know, particularly the humanity and social science. And how do you have a liberal art education? We're trying to find the new ways to, to transform to the university of the fourth industrial revolution. A symbol of that is the new university now being built at Hangzhou, West Lake. West Lake University is attracting the best talents back from abroad to teach the next generation. West Lake University, I think, is a bridge from the four decades of reform and opening up policy to the future. We are uh, trying our best to perpetuate the spirit of China's reform and opening up policy. For someone like myself, uh, raised in China, educated um, in professional school in the United States, I think we ought to be able to combine the strength of both cultural backgrounds and perhaps create a new type of university that serves China and the world in a much better way. Debates about education have been central to the story of China's modernization, not just in the last 40 years, but over the last 150. And now, in the 21st century, a new future is opening up.